Authorization runs out at the end of this month unless Congress agrees to renew the legislation. The House had been working on its own transportation bill. However, House Speaker Boehner pulled the House's five-year bill due to lack of support there. The House today is working on a bill that cuts regulations on small and medium-sized companies going public. You can follow House debate beginning at 10 on our companion network C-SPAN and now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Spirit, you are our strength and song. Who is like you, majestic in holiness and wondrous in mighty deeds? Give our senators this day understanding minds to legislate responsibly as they seek to govern in a way worthy of your goodness. Guide them by the light of your truth. Infuse them with your perfect peace as they keep their minds focused on you. May they overcome cynicism with civility in their relationships and work. O oh Lord, we wait for you and acknowledge that you alone are sovereign. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., March 8, 2012, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, the Senator from the State of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the Chair, signed Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader is recognized. Following Leader remarks, the Senate will be in period of morning business for an hour. The majority will control the first half of Republicans, the final half. Following morning business, the Senate will resume consideration of the surface transportation bill. As most know, last night, uh, late last night, we reached an agreement to move forward on the highway bill. Uh, under the order that's been issued, I can schedule those votes anytime uh, after consultation with the Republican leader, and so we have some 30 votes to complete today. We'll see how this works out. I think uh, we'll have the first vote. Uh, about 2.15 today and start working through these amendments. There's not going to be a lot of debate, so if anybody wants to speak on these uh, amendments, they better come over after the morning business hour and start telling people how they feel about the amendments because there's not going to be a time during the um, discussion of the amendments. Uh, Ms. President, I believe the S-2173 is at the desk due for a second reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S-2173, a bill to preserve and protect the free choice of individual employees to form, join, or assist labor organizations or to refrain from such activities. Uh, Mr. President, I would object to uh, any further proceedings with respect to this bill. Objection is heard. The bill will be placed on the calendar.
<clears throat> Mr. President. The Republican leader is recognized. Last night, the uh, two parties reached an agreement on amendments uh, to the highway bill, and as the majority leader will indicate shortly, uh, or may already have before I came to the floor, we'll be able to move forward on that uh, later today. I'm also happy to report there are a number of strong, very strong job-creating measures in the mix. Uh, one that stands out is Senator Hovind's amendment on the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, that massive private sector project that will create 20,000 jobs almost immediately. Most Americans uh, strongly support building the pipeline, and of course, uh, the significant number of construction jobs that would come along with it. It's incomprehensible to me that the President of the United States, I read, is actually lobbying against the Keystone Pipeline Amendment. There's a report this morning that the President is personally making phone calls to Democratic senators he thinks might vote for the amendment, asking them not to. And frankly, it's hard to even comprehend how out of touch, how completely out of touch he is on this issue. I mean, think about it. At, the moment when, at a moment when millions are out of work, uh, gas prices are literally skyrocketing, and the Middle East is in turmoil, We've got a president who's up making phone calls trying to block a pipeline here at home. It's really almost unbelievable. What we're seeing in Congress this week is a study in contrast. On the one hand, you've got a Republican-controlled House that's about to pass a bipartisan jobs bill that would help entrepreneurs and innovators by getting Washington out of the way. And today, we've got a Democratic-controlled Senate trying to line up votes against amendments that would create jobs and uh, a Democratic president lobbying against the biggest private sector job creation project in our country. So we've got an opportunity to work together to create jobs. Uh, we can do that with these amendments, and we can do that by taking up the bipartisan jobs bill the House will pass later today, and let me just say a word about that. The bipartisan jobs bill the House will pass later uh, today is supported by the president. Uh, it is ready to go, and I hope that once it gets over to the Senate, we'll simply take it up and pass it. I mean, it's an example of a measure supported by Republicans and Democrats and the President uh, that we believe will clear the House with a very large uh, majority. I think the sooner we pass that uh, here in the Senate uh, and send it down to the President for signature, uh, the better. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership, the majority leaders recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I was reminded this morning, uh, as I came to the floor, about an old uh, standard political joke. Uh, when I looked at my papers I had here, my outline, I was going to say, I was missing a page. So that's what the Republican leader and I were joking about here this morning. Uh, so that's why he went first, because I didn't have my speech. And the old political joke, as we've all heard many, many times, is this um, politician was giving this speech, and he's flipping through his pages, and he's in the midst of giving this. After he gets wound up in his speech, he's going through this speech, and he is waving his hands and shouting, and comes to his third or fourth page of his speech, and it says, um, you're on your own, you SOB. His speechwriter had enough of him. So that's kind of how I felt this morning. But that isn't what happened here today. Phoebe uh, prepared the speech for me, and uh, I left a part of it in my office. Mr. President, I'm pleased to say that Democrats and Republicans reached an agreement to advance the highway bill that's been before this body for more than a month, or I should say a month. It's a bipartisan bill. As I have said here over this past month, this is really a piece of legislation prepared the way legislation should be prepared. A very conservative member, Jim Minhoff from Oklahoma, very liberal member from California, Barbara Boxer, are the managers of this bill. They've worked hard on this. And just a little side note, Ms. President. So we were struggling through trying to come up with a, these amendments. 
I was happy to hear from Barbara Boxer. She said to me privately, I've talked to Senator Enhoff, and he thinks, as we were coming to this agreement, this isn't what should be done. That was really that was important to me in reaching a consensus on how we move forward <clears throat> forward on this bill, because as I've said many times, <clears throat> not everything we do this year should be a big fight. We should be able to move things forward and without um, waiting for a month to get things done. This bill is truly indicative of how we have to get things done and why I appreciate the cooperation of Boxer and Inhofe. We have a dilapidated system of highways. We have 70,000, Mr. President, I'm not misspeaking, not 7,000, 70,000 bridges in America that are in dire need of repair or replacement even. 20%, one out of every five miles in America, and in America, our roads are not up to safety standards. Thousands of pedestrians are killed because they relied on unsafe sidewalks or non-existing sidewalks. Every day, millions of Americans, a disproportionate number who are low income, minority, disabled, or old, are forced to rely on overcrowded mass transit systems, straining to meet the demands of growing ridership. America's crumbling infrastructure is a terrible drag on our economy. Think about it. Mr. President, I, a number of years ago, my wife and I took a few days off um, around Christmas in Southern California. And rather than fly back, I thought, why don't we drive back to Las Vegas? And we did that. This was just a couple of years ago. Mr. President, I hadn't done it in a long, long time. I-15, this famous road, just jammed. We, had, we came to complete stops on a number of occasions coming back from San Diego to Las Vegas. Now think about that. Complete stop. Trucks on that road, they're being, the drivers are being paid for their time on the road. The cargo they're hauling needs to get someplace. It really is not only someone wanting to take a vacation coming to Las Vegas, it's what it does to commerce to have these roads that are in a state of disrepair. So it's certainly, this crumbling infrastructure is a drag on our economy. But rebuilding this infrastructure will have the opposite effect. Investing in our transportation system will create or save almost three million jobs. This legislation has to be completed before the end of this month, or we have no way of collecting the taxes when you buy a gallon of gasoline that funds what we need to do here to repair our roads, bridges, et cetera. This is not some wild program invented in the last few months here in Washington. This is a program that was initiated by President Eisenhower. This week I received a letter from an organization called I Make America, a group of more than 850 businesses and 20,000 individuals who support this transportation bill. Many people across the country, and some in this chamber, would write off the rest of this Congress. But I'm not going to do that. We have a lot more to do. We need to get it done. When we complete our work, Mr. President, we have, um, we, 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 we need to look back and say what has happened is good. There is no single piece of legislation now before Congress that will do more to immediately create American jobs and sharpen our global competitiveness than this piece of legislation said Dennis Slater on behalf of I Make America, the program I just talked about. So we need to push this bill over the finish line, and I think the finish line is now in sight. This is one of the most important pieces of legislation that we can consider, and I've indicated earlier why. But even as I recognize the bipartisanship that made this progress possible, I sound a note of caution. 85 senators voted to begin debate on this legislation. Only a handful, it wasn't 15, only a handful, uh, because we had absent senators that day, said that we shouldn't move forward on it. Yet it has taken a month to begin voting on amendments. Republican leaders have wasted weeks of the Senate's time obstructing this valuable jobs bill to extract purely political, purely political votes on unrelated matters, completely unrelated matters. Weeks were wasted on this 
vital legislation with an iconic attack on women's health. So I suggest to the Republican leader, who just left the floor, if it takes more than a month to pass a non-controversial bipartisan bill that is supportive of almost 90 senators, how can we ever expect to get anything more done? We have to. We have much more to do. Much more to do. Americans are not satisfied with the glacial pace, and neither am I, of this body. Americans are tired of delay tactics and distractions, and so am I. People across the country and in this chamber would write off this Congress and say, we've done enough. I'm not going to do that. When we complete our legislation on this transportation bill, we have other things to do. Mr. President, we have a score of judges that have been waiting, some waiting way in the last year. We have to do something about the post office. Postal service in America has changed. People don't pay their bills the way they used to. They don't send letters the way they used to. So we're going to have to reorganize the post office. We have to do that. We had a demonstration here in our classified briefing room to talk about what's going on in America and what could go on in America with bringing down our bringing down our country. The demonstration last night dealt with electricity, but it could be banking, could be our hospitals. We have to recognize that we now have new enemies in the world. Not enemies that are flying airplanes and dropping bombs necessarily and shooting us with bullets, but they're prepared to do something that is so damaging to our economy. And we were given that illustration last night. We have a cybersecurity bill that we have to bring to the floor. Another bipartisan bill. Senator Lieberman, Senator Collins, Democrat and Republican, Independent and Republican, have acknowledged that they want to bring this bill forward. And they have it done, and so we're going to bring it to the floor. We have all of our transportation bills. We have to do those. So we, Mr. President, have a lot to do to accomplish even a fraction of our to-do list. And it's going to take more cooperation and less conflict. Not everything has to be a knockdown, drag out fight as it was on this highway bill. To think that we wasted three months on a matter dealing with health of women in America, but we did. So we stand ready to work with our Republican colleagues. The Republican leader mentioned the small business jobs bill. We've been trying to do one for a long time. We're going to do a small business jobs bill. The House bill is not perfect. We're glad it's moving forward. And we're going to try to do something here to match so that we can get to conference and get this done. I'm hopeful that when Democrats reach across the aisle, we'll find willing partners on the other side for a change. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the chair announce the business of the day. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, there will now be a period of morning business for one hour, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each with the time equally divided and controlled by the two leaders or their designees, with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the final half. Mr. President. Senator from Washington is recognized. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that David Benelli, a detailee to the Commerce, Science and Transportation from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, be given floor privileges for the duration of consideration of S-1813. Without objection. Mr. President, I come to the floor today to join my colleagues to mark International Women's Day here on the Senate floor. This day, which across the globe is celebrated in many different ways, is at its core a day to reflect on the achievements of women, achievements in politics, business, society. It's a day to reflect on what women's role was in the not-so-distant past and to celebrate how far we've come. But unfortunately, Mr. President, on this International Women's Day in the year 2012, we cannot celebrate the progress we have made without also acknowledging the unsettling truth that that progress is under threat. Today, a shadow has been cast over this day of celebration by efforts to turn back the clock here in Washington, D.C. and across the country. 
efforts that we all must fight back against. Mr. President, here in the Senate, only a week ago, we had a debate on the ability for a woman, women across this country to access contraceptives. It's a debate that most women believed was so, uh, settled half a century ago, and one we had all hoped was in the past. However, in a scene that was eerily reminiscent of a half a century ago, last week, one woman brave enough to come forward and give voice to the importance of birth control was targeted. First, her story of a friend's battle with ovarian cancer was purposely left out of a House hearing on women's health. And then, as we've all heard, she was scorned and ridiculed by a right-wing pundit. It was a galvanizing and eye-opening moment for millions of women in our country. It was a reminder that there are some who still see women as easy targets. And it awakened many women to the fact that the gains we are meant to celebrate on a day like today could easily be lost to a political stat strategy that preys on women. Now, Mr. President, for many of those who watched the last few weeks play out, it may have seemed just like an isolated incident. It would, could appear to some a sudden and swift effort by some Republicans that have thankfully been blocked for the time being, but that's not the case. The truth is that women's access to care has rarely been at greater risk. Mr. President, from the moment they came into power, the Republicans in the House of Representatives have been waging a war on women's health. If you don't believe me, just look at the very first bills they introduced when they arrived here. Now, they campaigned across the country in the last election on a platform of jobs and the economy. But the first three bills they introduced when they got here were direct attacks on women's health. The very first one, H.R. 1, would have totally eliminated Title X funding for family planning and teen pregnancy prevention. And it included an amendment that would have completely defunded Planned Parenthood and cut off support for the millions of women who count on it. Another one of their first bills would have permanently codified the Hyde Amendment and the D.C. abortion ban. And finally, they introduced a bill that would have ro rolled back every single one of the gains we made for women in the health care reform bill. That Republican bill would have removed the caps on your out-of-pocket expenses that literally protect women from losing their homes or their life savings if they get sick. It would have ended the ban on lifetime limits on coverage, so important to everyone. It would have allowed insurance companies to once again discriminate against women by charging them higher premiums than men or even denying women care because of so-called pre-existing conditions that they have, like pregnancy. And it would have rolled back the guarantee that insurance companies cover contraceptives. Mr. President, Republicans have shown they will go to just about any length to limit access to women's care, even shutting down the federal government. Now, that may seem extreme to all of you, but that is exactly what happened one year ago when Republicans nearly shut down the federal government over a rider that was yet another attempt to go after Title X and Planned Parenthood. I remember sitting in those meetings here late at night after months of negotiations over the numbers in the budget, astonished that Republicans were willing to throw all those negotiations over one, away over one issue, and that was their attack on women's health. And Mr. President, the attack on women's rights are not just taking place here in the nation's capital. In state after state across the country, legislators bent on putting politics between women and their health care are undoing years of important work. A recently enacted law in Texas not only strips women of their rights, but of their dignity. It's a law that Nicholas Kristof of the New York Times recently wrote about a column, and I ask unanimous consent to put it in the record today. Without objection. It's a law that all women across the country should be insulted by and outraged over. Today, nearly 40 years after Roe v. Wade has passed, a woman in Texas who seeks out an abortion, one of the most difficult choices a woman and her family can face, she's not met with compassion and care, but with humiliation. And that's because they have passed a law by Republicans that she is now subjected against her will to a vaginal ultrasound. 
Then she's instructed to listen to a fetal heartbeat, watch the ultrasound, and numerous other state-mandated hurdles. And then she has to go home and wait for 24 hours before she can access a health care procedure that was made right, a right for women four decades ago. Now, you would think that after two years spent railing against any government involvement in health care, Republicans wouldn't want to dictate to states, or want the state to dictate procedures that a doctor must perform on a w woman, whether she wants them or not. But then you'd be confused, because clearly, when it comes to women and their health care choices, these Republicans are willing to do whatever it takes for them to call the shots. Not the woman, not her doctor, not her family. And Mr. President, the sad part is, other states across the country are now contemplating similar laws. So Mr. President, the threats to women's health care are very real, and they're growing. We saw it on a panel on contraceptives in the House that didn't include a woman on the panel. We saw it on a young woman being called horrible names for telling the stories of a friend in need. We see it in Republican efforts to allow an employer to dictate whether a woman has access to contraceptives. And we're seeing it in state laws across the country aimed at stripping women of their rights and more. So on this International Women's Day, we celebrate our gains with the clear understanding that they must always be defended. And we join with women everywhere to make sure that progress is not reversed. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Maryland is recognized. Mr. President, let me thank Senator Murray for her, her comments and let me concur in, in her observations. Uh, what we've seen on women's health care issues here in this body where some are trying to turn the clock back on the progress that we have made. Uh, I was listening to my colleague talk about the ultrasounds. Well, Virginia just enacted an ultrasound bill uh, this week. The governor signed it into law. So this is spreading to other states. We talk about big government, government mandating ultrasound for pregnant women. Uh, this is uh, outrageous and something that on International Women's Day, it's right that we bring this to the attention of our colleagues. We've seen the same type uh, of action taken against family planning, contraceptives, those who want to repeal Roe v. Wade. Uh, we've got to stand strong with women and women's health care issues uh, as we, America, leads in the international community. Around the world, International Women's Day is an occasion to honor and praise women for their accomplishments. This International Women's Day, I stand here with my colleagues to celebrate women who are making a difference, both here in America and around the world, in countries where they lead in the fight for justice, equality, and fairness for all women. All of us, women and men alike, can help by supporting women's efforts to claim their legal rights, live free from violence, earn a decent income, get an education, grow food for their families, and make their voices heard in their communities and beyond. I believe in the power of women to change the world and to help them hasten that change. U.S. international assistance policy should address and remove barriers between women, women's rights, and economic empowerment. Empowering women is one of the most critical tools in our toolbox to fight poverty and injustice. Integrating the unique needs of women into our domestic and international policies is critical. As chairman of the International Development and Foreign Assistance Subcommittee of Foreign Relations, I can attest that this must be the bedrock of our foreign assistance programming if it is to be successful. I defy anyone's assertion that women's empowerment should take a backseat to so-called more important priorities. Decades of research and experience prove that when women are able to be fully engaged in society and hold decision-making power, they are more likely to invest their income in food, clean water, education, and health care for their children. This creates a positive cycle of change that lifts entire families, communities, and nations out of poverty. Simply put, when women succeed, we all do. Accordingly, I was very pleased by last week's release of the new USAID policy for gender equality and female empowerment, which makes integrating gender and including women and girls central to all U.S. international assistance. This policy, which updates guidelines that were over 30 years old, recognizes that the integration of women and girls is basic to effective international assistance across all sectors, 
like food, security, health, climate change, science, technology, economic growth, democracy, and governance, of, and humanitarian assistance. It aims to increase the capacity of women and girls and decrease inequality between genders and also decrease gender-based violence. This new policy is as welcome as it is necessary. As Secretary Clinton declared earlier this year, achieving, achieving our objectives for global development will demand accelerated efforts to achieve gender equality and women's empowerment. Otherwise, peace and prosperity will have their own glass ceiling. Unfortunately, as we know, there are still places in this, that this glass ceiling exists, and there are major obstacles to women. Worldwide, one in three women will experience some form of violence in her lifetime. Women and girls in emergencies, conflict settings, and natural disasters are all, often face extreme violence, including being forced to exchange sex for food. The World Health Organization has reported that up to 70 percent of women in some countries described as having been victims of domestic violence at some stage in their lives. The United States has the potential to be a true leader in preventing and responding to violence against women and girls, an issue that is inextricably linked to U.S. diplomacy, development, and national security goals. What many people fail to realize that is violence against women and girls is both a, has both a major consequence and cause of poverty. Violence and poverty go hand in hand. Violence prevents women and girls from getting an education, going to work, and earning the income they need to lift their families out of poverty. We know that one in three women will be victims of physical or sexual abuse in their lifetime. But we also know that women have the potential to lift their families and communities out of poverty. Violence against women and girls is an extreme human rights violation, a public health epidemic, and a barrier to solving global challenges such as extreme poverty, HIV AIDS, and conflict. It devastates the lives of millions of women and girls in peacetime and in conflict, and knows no national or cultural barrier. Today, let us reaffirm our commitment to end gender-based discrimination in all forms, to end violence against women and girls worldwide, and encourage the people of the United States to observe International Women's Day. On this day and every day, I'm proud to stand in support of women across America and worldwide. Investing in and focusing on empowering women and girls is one of the most efficient uses of our foreign assistance dollars and one of the best ways to make the world more peaceful and prosperous. As Secretary of State Clinton pointed out more than 15 years ago, women's rights are human rights, and nothing is more fundamental, in my opinion. With that, Mr. President, I would yield the floor. Mr. Senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm really pleased to join my colleagues, Senator Cardin and earlier Senator Murray, this morning in commemorating International Women's Day. It's a day observed around the world, and it celebrates the economic, political, and social achievements of women past, present, and future. It's a day which recognizes the obstacles that women still face in the struggle for equal rights and equal opportunities. One year ago today, I, along with a group of bipartisan senators, introduced and passed a resolution in the Senate recognizing the significance of the 100th anniversary of International Women's Day. Today, the 101st anniversary, and like the centennial milestone before it, it is a testament to the dedication and determination of women and men around the world to address gender inequality for the good of all people. There are more than 3.3 billion women in the world today, and across the globe, women are participating in the political, social, and economic life of their communities in an unprecedented fashion, playing a critical role in providing and caring for their families, contributing substantially to the growth of economies and advancing food security for their communities. Yesterday, I had the wonderful, humbling, and inspiring opportunity to recognize and celebrate the 10 recipients of the 2012 State Department International Women of Courage Awards. This prestigious award, which is the only award in the State Department given only to women, annually recognizes women who have shown exceptional courage and leadership in advocating for women's rights and empowerment around the globe. 
often at significant risk to themselves. These award winners, including activists in the Sudan and Saudi Arabia, politicians in Turkey and Afghanistan, and representatives from six other countries, are truly remarkable and inspirational women. And Mr. President, I would like to submit all of their names and brief bios for the record so that they're properly recognized by the Senate. Without objection. Thank you. Um, this morning I want to pick just one of these amazing women and tell her story. Shad Begum is the Executive Director of the Union of Women's Welfare in one of the most extremely conservative districts in all of Pakistan. As the founder and executive director of the program, the Union of Women's Welfare, she provides political training, microcredit, primary education, and health services to women throughout her community. She not only encouraged others to run for office, she herself ran for a district councilor seat in 2001 and 2005, winning the seat against local conservatives who tried to ban women from participating. Despite numerous threats to her life and her family, including calls for suicide attacks against her by local extremists, she continues to work to improve the lives of women throughout Pakistan. Ms. Shad is one of 10 remarkable women that the State Department honored this year, and every one of their 10 stories is inspirational. Um, but they represent literally millions of women around the globe who are out there fighting and suffering to be heard. There are countless women who don't receive recognition that they deserve, who continue to be silenced by persecution and harassment. And today, we recognize, honor, and celebrate all of those nameless, faceless women around the world who are continuing the fight. Far too many women remain excluded from full participation in society to the detriment of their communities, their countries, and the world. And although strides have been made in recent decades, women across the globe continue to face significant obstacles in all aspects of their lives, including the denial of basic human rights, discrimination, and gender-based violence. According to the World Bank, women make up 70% of all individuals living in poverty. Women account for 64% of the adults worldwide who lack basic liter literacy skills. Women continue to remain vastly underrepresented in national and local governments around the world. So there's no doubt that we have a lot of work to do. But all of society benefits when women are more fully integrated into their communities and their villages around the world. In the words of President Obama, our common prosperity will be advanced by allowing all humanity, men and women, to reach their full potential. As we reflect on the past, present, and future achievements of women, I think it's important to recognize the vital and untapped resource that women represent for our world. The ability of women to realize their full potential is critical to the ability of a nation to achieve strong and lasting economic growth political and social stability, and enhanced security for all its people. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I yield the floor and note the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. President. Senator from New Hampshire is recognized. I ask that the quorum call be lifted. Without objection. Um, Mr. President, I have six unanimous consent requests for committees to meet during today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent that these requests be agreed to and that these requests be printed in the record. Without objection. Thank you. I yield the floor and note the absence of the quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
The Senate came in this morning at 9.30. We expect them to, sometime this morning at 10.30 or sometime after 10.30, to resume consideration of the uh, transportation bill, which has been uh, stuck in the Senate for quite some time. Senate Majority Leader Reid announced an agreement late yesterday that uh, beginning this afternoon they will take up a number of amendments and under the agreement uh, there could be votes on up to uh, 30 amendments on the uh, two-year transportation bill. The Senate version is a two-year transportation bill. The House meanwhile, Speaker Boehner had been, the House had been working on their own version, a five-year version. However, the Speaker pulled the House's version due to a lack of support over there, but look for lots of votes this afternoon here in the Senate on amendments to the transportation bill.
Senator from Georgia is recognized. I'd ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Objection. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd also like to ask permission of the chair to display during my remarks this box. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. President. Mr. Mr. Uh, President, thank you. I am proud to stand here today and on International Women's Day, the eighth day of March, 2012, to pay tribute to women around the world, but also to acknowledge that women around the world on Monday, March the 12th, will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Girl Scouts of America. Founded in Savannah, Georgia, a beautiful town by a wonderful Georgia lady, Juliette Lowe. And Girl Scouts around the world will be celebrating the founding of that great organization, which has had a positive effect on women around the world. Now, Mr. President, each of us that right now is well aware of the Girl Scouts because this box that you gave me permission to display are what's left of a box of Thin Mints that Girl Scouts sell this time of year to raise money for their, uh, their operation around the world. I eat far too many of them. They're good. They're good for me, and they're good for America, and they're good for the Girl Scouts and the fundraising that they do. But, you know, the Girl Scouts is an organization of leadership, developing women for the future. While only 17% of this body are women. So almost all of them were Girl Scouts. Almost all women of business were Girl Scouts. And almost all women who were in Girl Scouts pay tribute to the Girl Scouts of America and the contribution that they made to their life. There are 3.2 million active Girl Scouts today, and there are 50 million Girl Scout alumni. That is a tremendous impact on all that's right about America. And the Girl Scouts have been pace setters. Dr. Martin Luther King, a native of my city of Atlanta and a native of our state that Juliette Lowe was from, cited them, the Girl Scouts of America, as an agent for desegregation during the troubled times of the 1950s and the 1960s. Girl Scouts were at the forefront of integration and leadership for youth. The Girl Scouts of America also pledge themselves and they make a promise, which I'd like to read. On my honor, I will try to serve my God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. 
which reads, I will do my best to be honest and faithful, friendly and helpful, considered and caring, courageous and strong, responsible for what I do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, to use resources wisely to make the world a better place, and to be a sister to every Girl Scout. That's not a motto just for the Girl Scouts, but one that would serve us all well in this body. So on this International Women's Day on March the 8th, I'd like to acknowledge that on Monday, when we're not in session around the world, women will celebrate the founding of the Girl Scouts of America and the 3.2 million Girl Scouts in America they will be building for the future that you and I work for today in this body, the United States Senate. And I yield back the balance of my time and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President. Senator from Tennessee is recognized. Are we in a quorum call, sir? Yes, we are. I'd uh, like unanimous consent to vitiate the quorum call. Without objection. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, uh, uh, later today uh, I'll be down on the floor to offer a budget uh, point of order on the highway bill. I've been down here several times over the course of the last several days. I, I think most in this body, a uh, large majority of the people in this body, have been a part of encouraging us to, in a very bipartisan way, solve the budget problems that we have in this country. There were 64 of us, 32 on each side of the aisle, that signed a letter to the president encouraging him to really adopt some of the principles that were laid out in Bowles Simpson. Uh, after that, there was a very large number of uh, senators on both sides of the aisle that signed a letter to the super committee asking them to go big and really deal in a serious way with the budget issues that our country, the deficit issues that our country is dealing with. Um, and I've been down here, Mr. President, uh, multiple times talking about uh, the various oddities in this bill. Um, what's getting ready to happen in this bill is we're, we're actually, over the next two years, going to create a 10 to $11 billion deficit. Uh, because of the various gimmickry that we use, we're figuring out ways of getting around that. Uh, and one of the budget gimmicks we're using in this bill is we're going to spend the money over a two-year period, but we're going to pay for it over an eight, a ten-year period. Two years worth of spending, ten years worth of revenues. Uh, the senator was, uh, I think, here during the period of time we had the health care debate here in our nation. and. Many of the folks on my side of the aisle, rightfully so, were concerned about the health care bill because there were six years' worth of cost and ten years' worth of revenues, and a lot of people thought that was a budget gimmick. Candidly, many of my friends on the other side of the aisle, while they may have supported the bill, were also concerned about those same types of uh, gimmicks being used in the health care bill and, and, you know, caused them concerns. My point is that in a bipartisan way, uh, we have tried to, to deal with our budget deficits in this country. I noticed the senator from Illinois just stepped on the floor, has been a major, major player in those initiatives. And yet, what, so what we did was last year, we passed something called the Budget Control Act. We did so in order to raise the debt ceiling uh, and to accomplish uh, discipline in this body so that over the next two years, we, est we established uh, overall caps in spending. This bill, believe it or not, here we are in March, with a very popular bill, 
which speaks to the fact to me it's the kind of bill that many of us would think if you really want to pass a highway bill, you would prioritize it higher than other spending. It's the kind of thing that in a bipartisan way we would come together and say, okay, we really want to see infrastructure spending in this country, so let's make this of higher priority than other spending. That's not what we're doing, Mr. President. Believe it or not, this United States Senate, which has talked big about deficit spending, written lots of letters, had lots of meetings, what this Senate is getting ready to do with this bill is violate the Budget Control Act that we passed last year trying to show the American people we had at least a modicum of discipline. Let, let me say it one more time. This highway bill, in March of this year, we passed this, I think, uh, we passed it last August, the early part of August, to demonstrate to the American people that this United States Senate, this Congress, had the discipline to put caps on spending over the next two years to begin the process of addressing deficit reduction. And what we're going to do if we pass this highway bill as laid out is we're going to violate that budget cap right now. Mr. President, I, I just want everybody in this body to know that I plan to offer a budget point of order. I would hope that at least all of those 64 senators, 32 on each side, would join me in opposing breaking the Budget Control Act that we just put in place in an effort to demonstrate to the American people and candidly the world who buy our treasury bonds that we have the ability, the discipline, to deal with the fiscal issues that we have in our nation. Mr. President, I know we have the distinguished senator from Texas who was to speak uh, exactly right now. I yield the floor and thank you for the time. Mr. President, Senator from Texas is recognized. Mr. President, what is the uh, regular order? It, we're currently in morning business with 20 minutes and 16 seconds left. Right, Republican side. I thank the uh, I thank the chair. Mr. President, I've come to the floor to express my concerns on behalf of the 26 million constituents that I have in Texas about rising gas prices and the administration's failure to take reasonable and rational and practical steps to help ease the pain that Americans are feeling at the gas pump. Just think about it. We know unemployment is uh, unacceptably high and intractable, uh, notwithstanding our private sector economy's best efforts to get to grow and to get to uh, create jobs. So we know people are out of work. We know many of them are unable to pay their uh, mortgage and are literally losing their homes to foreclosure. Those who are fortunate enough to have jobs are experiencing higher prices when it comes to food, when it comes to health care, notwithstanding the passage of the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which the President said the fa average family would save $2,500 in the health care premiums. Uh, last year alone, there was almost a double-digit increase in the cost of health care uh, for most American uh, families. And now to add insult to injury, uh, we have higher gas prices which are uh, crowding out other spending and uh, lowering the standard of living uh, for American families who are struggling uh, with uh, the slow uh, economic recovery that we're experiencing. The average U.S. price of gasoline has more than doubled since the week of the inauguration of President Obama in January 2009. In January 2009, the gas, gas, a gallon of regular gas was $1.84 a gallon. Today, it averages $3.79 a gallon. The, Amer the Associated Press reports that the average American household spent $4,155 filling up at the pump in 2011. That's the annual cost of gasoline for a typical U.S. household. I remember arguments, passionate arguments about the payroll tax holiday and the president holding press conference after press conference saying, if we would just pass the payroll tax holiday, 
then families would have $40 more a month spending money in their pocket. Well, higher gas prices has wiped that out and more. Gasoline costs now amount to 8.4 percent of the median household income. 8.4 percent. I'm not telling anybody something they don't already know and they haven't already felt, they haven't already experienced. Everyone has experienced these higher prices. This is the highest price for gasoline since 1981 when uh, costs soared because of the crisis, another crisis in the Middle East. Two weeks ago, President Obama said that there's very little he could do about high gas prices in the short term. I tell you, it's good he made those comments in Miami, Florida, and not Midland, Texas, because Texans know that greater domestic energy production would help reduce oil prices and therefore reduce gasoline prices. Roughly 70 percent of the price of, uh, of gasoline is the price of oil that is uh, refined, that gasoline is refined from. You know, sometimes I feel like in Washington, D.C., we are operating in a parallel universe that has very little in common with the rest of the country. And here it's as if, uh, not to mix my metaphors, but ships passing in the night, but the fact of the matter is the laws of supply and demand cannot be suspended by the United States Congress or the President of the United States. President Obama used to agree with that. Last March, for example, he said producing more oil in America would help lower oil prices. Well, lip service will not produce lower oil prices, but yes, producing more oil will, because the greater the supply, we know that the laws of economics say that uh, demand being the same, that the greater supply will lower prices. And the fact of the matter is there's greater demand all around the world, not just in the United States as economies are growing in China, um, in India, and Brazil, and places like that. To add insult to injury, this administration has adopted policies that directly conflict with the goal of lowering oil and gasoline prices. I don't know how to reach any other conclusion but to say it appears to me that the administration is intentionally enacting policies that will raise gasoline prices. I know they will deny that. They'll say it's just not true. But I don't know any other explanation. And let me, let me uh, provide you the, the evidence that I think led me to that conclusion, and perhaps you will agree. Today we learned that President Obama has been busy calling senators on the other side of the aisle and asking them to vote against an amendment being offered by Senator Hoven of North Dakota that would allow the Keystone XL pipeline project to move forward. The President on the phone calling senators saying vote against the Keystone XL pipeline amendment offered by Senator Hoven. The President has previously said there's not a single morning he wakes up when he does not think about creating jobs. But apparently, he woke up today thinking about how to lobby against jobs. Because the Keystone Pipeline, in addition to providing an additional supply of crude oil from the tar sands in Canada that would be transported to the United States and turned into gasoline, in uh, places like uh, Port Arthur, Texas, uh, apparently the President got up and thought about how can, I, how can I obstruct additional supply, how can I destroy the jobs that would be created, which is directly contrary to what he professes he does when he wakes up each morning thinking about how to create new jobs. The Keystone XL pipeline is a $7 billion private investment that will create 20,000 jobs in construction and manufacturing alone. It will add tens of thousands of additional jobs throughout the economy and other sectors that will support the pipeline construction. Now this is kind of personal for me and my constituents in Texas because we're an energy producing state. We actually think that's a good thing because it's created a lot of jobs. It's allowed us to weather this recession we've been through and uh, because people have uh, 
voted with their feet and they've moved from other parts of the country to Texas because that's where the jobs are so they can provide for their families and they can uh, try to achieve the American dream. But Texas as a whole provides more than a quarter of America's total refining capacity. Last month, when the uh, subject of the Keystone Pipeline was very much in the news, I visited with a number of refinery workers in Port Arthur, Texas, who expressed concern about the future of their livelihood. These constituents of mine in Port Arthur, Texas, could care less about the politics here in Washington, D.C. Who wins, who loses, you know, the sorts of stuff that seems to be a, a fascination, an obsession here inside the Beltway. But they were particularly upset, not just Republicans, but Democrats, independents, unaffiliated folks, they were particularly upset with the Obama administration's rejection over the permit for the Keystone XL pipeline, which as I say would terminate in, Port, in the Port Arthur region and allow our state to refine an extra 700,000 barrels of oil each day, turn it into gasoline and other refined products that would increase the supply and thus, according to the laws of economics, have a tendency to bring prices down as you increase supply. President Obama's behind the scenes maneuvering in this crusade is the starkest reminder yet. He is the only thing standing between this country and more jobs and energy security. I regret to reach that conclusion, but I don't know any other reasonable conclusion to raise. Rather than ask Saudi Arabia and other OPEC countries to produce more oil, in a region where our troops have been deployed for 10 years or more, is there any coincidence that in the oil producing regions of the world that we depend upon for oil that our American troops have fought and some made the ultimate sacrifice to protect our country, to protect our economy, to protect our way of life? But there have been some in this chamber who have suggested that we ought to go hat in hand to Saudi Arabia and say, will you please open the spigot a little a little wider? Will you please supply us more oil so we don't have to do it in America? You can do it for us and we can buy it from you? Well, I believe that this administration should work closely with our partners in Canada, a friendly country where we don't have to worry about a disruption of supply because if the Iranian threat to block the Strait of Hormuz comes to pass, 20 percent of the world's oil supply passes through the Strait of Hormuz, and you know what that would do to price, not to mention other consequences which are entirely negative. Canada is a reliable and geographically secure trading partner whose oil exports are insulated from the potential supply disruptions in the Middle East. Rather than demonizing oil and gas companies that employ millions of hardworking Americans while wagering more taxpayer dollars on boondoggles like Solyndra, the Obama administration should take its regulatory boot off the neck of our domestic energy producers. As I said, this is personal for me and my constituents because Texans are proud that our state remains the leading United States producer of oil and gas. And as I said, it's what's helped us grow and create an awful lot of jobs, which people are grateful for. And we know as a scientific fact that America has just begun to tap the potential of its vast resources. According to the Congressional Research Service, our country has more recoverable energy resources than Canada, China, and Saudi Arabia combined. As American Enterprise Institute scholar Kenneth Green has noted, the outer continental shelf of the United States alone contains enough fuel, enough oil, to fuel 85 million cars for 35 years. Yet more than 97 percent of that territory is not under lease as a result of Obama administration policies. Expanding access to federal offshore and off, onshore and offshore lands, eliminating permit delays in the issuance of leases could help reduce prices and strengthen our energy security while creating jobs and boosting revenue to the local, state, and federal government. 
That would help us close our budget gap. Unfortunately, the Obama administration's proposed offshore oil and natural gas leasing plan for 2012 to 2017 eliminates, eliminates 50 percent of lease sales provided for in the previous plan and imposes a moratorium on developing energy from 14 billion barrels of oil and 55 trillion cubic feet of natural gas in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The moratorium on the natural resource-rich Gulf of Mexico and persistent delays in permits and shallow and deep water leases could result in a 19 percent decrease in production in 2012. A 19 percent decrease in production. So we're not only talking about keeping the production static, we're talking about actually decreasing supply as a result of federal uh, administration policies and decreasing supply will have the inevitable effect of raising gasoline prices as that happens. And then there's the regulatory impact. Everywhere I go in my state and as I talk to people around the country, they come to visit us in the capital, they say, if they're in the private sector, they say the biggest threat to our ability to start a new business or grow existing businesses and create jobs is regulatory overreach. Now we know during the last election the voters gave us divided government. They made it harder for the Obama administration single-handedly to pass policies on a partisan basis like the president's health care bill, like the stimulus, like, uh, like Dodd-Frank. So we got divided government. What we did not get is an ability to stop the regulatory overreach of executive branch agencies. If the president is serious about looking for every single area where we can make an impact on gas prices, as he pledged in Miami, he must reverse the regulatory overreach of the last three years. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce reports that the Environmental Protection Agency alone is moving forward with 31 major economic rules and 172 major policy changes. That's not something that Congress is legislating. That's what the EPA is doing on its own because they're an executive branch administrative agency. But they're going to have a negative impact on our energy supply. The Chamber of Commerce rightly calls this an unprecedented level of regulatory action. And it has a chilling effect not only on energy production, it has a chilling effect on jobs, something we need more than anything else as our economy struggles to recover. Even as gas prices have approached $4 a gallon, the Environmental Protection Agency proposes, has proposed a Tier 3 rule to cut air emissions from fuels and light-duty vehicles. This rule alone would force refiners of oil to gasoline to make dramatic changes in the way they do business. A recent study concluded the rule would increase the cost of manufacturing gasoline by 12 to 25 cents per gallon. So as high as they are now, once this rule goes into effect, the price you pay at the pump could go from 12 to 25 cents higher. It could also inflate the refining industry's operating costs by $5 billion to $13 billion annually and lead to a 7 to 14 percent reduction in gas supplies from U.S. refiners and force as many as seven U.S. refineries to cut down. We've already seen recent reports of a number of refineries that produce gasoline here in America on the East Coast shutting down because they can't do business economically under this regulatory burden. Beyond the Tier 3 rule, the American energy, American energy producers are deeply worried about the EPO's, EPA's proposed greenhouse gas regulations, which will serve as an energy tax on consumers. They're also worried, as if that wasn't enough, about the agency's new source performance standards and its boiler maximum achievable control technology rule. Now, I know a lot of this sounds like arcane stuff that's not uh, something that uh, people talk about over the kitchen table, but each and every one of these and cumulatively have had a negative impact on gasoline prices and are directly harming American families in their pocketbook, lowering their standard of living, 
making it harder for them to get by, even as they struggle with the economic, a slow economic recovery. Collectively, if we were to have a moratorium on these regulations until, at least until we begin to see unemployment come down, the economy grow, gas prices come down, but collectively these regulations put more U.S. refiners out of business and lead to ever higher gasoline prices at the pump. So conversely, if we were to have a temporary moratorium on them, it would provide much needed relief to hardworking American families. And if that weren't enough, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been very active as well. I mentioned Midland, Texas, which is part of the historic Permian Basin, which has been a huge source of oil and gas production. Well, thanks to enhanced production techniques, new technology, innovation, uh, it's seeing, experiencing a second boom and uh, creating lots of jobs and a lot of American uh, energy. So what a surprise it was when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, announced its intention to list the sand dune lizard, a little five-inch lizard in the Permian Basin, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service said, we're, we're going to list that as an endangered species without adequate investigation, without adequate investigation of the science. It threatened the jobs of nearly 27,000 Texans in the Permian Basin, which is home to more than one-fifth of the top 100 oil fields in America. Looking at all the evidence on energy prices, it's hard to come to any conclusion other than that higher energy prices are part of President Obama's plan. He talks about green energy and green jobs. Those are great, but they only supply a single digit percentage, a low single digit percentage of our energy needs. We, we have to produce American energy, our oil and gas reserves. But President Obama's policies have intentionally elevated the price of gasoline much to the detriment of the American consumer. So one of the things we could do is we can pass this Keystone XL pipeline amendment. It will eventually provide 700,000 barrels a day of oil from Canada to be refined here in America, creating jobs and creating more uh, supply, which will have a beneficial impact on gasoline prices, notwithstanding the other policies that I've mentioned this morning. So I hope my colleagues will support uh, Senator Hovind's amendment. I certainly will. Uh, I would love to hear the contrary argument. Uh, unfortunately, we hear uh, nothing but crickets when we start talking about all of, the, uh, all of the beneficial effects of this policy. And I just invite my colleagues who maybe don't come from an energy producing state to go on the internet and Google or use Bing or whatever search engines you want and just type in U.S. oil and gas pipelines and look at the picture that comes up, you will be astonished, perhaps, to see all of the pipelines that are operating in America safely, without the public really knowing about it, but providing the, the oil and gas and other refined products that we need in order to keep our economy growing. So this pipeline is not a threat to the environment because we have adequate safeguards in place and have for a long, long time. Mr. President, I yield the floor.